Moving through our world has its dangers. One false step or bad reach can send lightning bolts of pain that may stay with us for months. Muscle sprains, pains, and how he complains tonight on Call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. Although sprains can occur in both the upper and lower parts of the body, the most common site is the ankle. According to the National Institutes of Health, it is estimated that more than 628,000 ankle sprains occur in the United States each year. We will muscle our way through those quest that issue and your questions on muscle pain, and, and we appreciate your questions. But before we get into this story, we're going to take a look at this week's Prairie Doc Quiz question. It is a true or false question. The best treatment for tendonitis is a non-medicinal combination of physical treatments and a plan of gradual increase in activity. True or false? Viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing to win a signed copy of our book, The Picture of Health. Each of my essays originally written for this show comes with a wonderful accompanying photograph by Dr. Judith Peterson, our guest for the evening. <laughs> We will announce the answer and the winner at the end of the show. Remember, you only have 10 minutes to get your answer in on the quiz. But for the hour of the show, we will answer your medical questions about muscular pain as they are called in or sent to us via Facebook or email. Call in questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to the address on the screen. Joining us tonight is a great friend of our program, who's been on the show 200,000 times or at least. At, at well, least. At least. <laughs> a great photographer who shot all the pictures for the book that we give away each week with our quiz questions, Dr. Judith Peterson from the Yankton Medical Clinic. Thank you for joining us, Judith. Thank you so much for having me, Rick. It is truly a pleasure. Yep. Well, and it's our pleasure to have you here. Now, uh, you were a physiatrist. People don't understand that very well. So explain to us, let's start with that. What is a physiatrist, Judith? Well, a physiatrist is also called physical medicine and rehabilitation. And physiatrists or rehab medicine physicians deal with problems of muscles, deal with problems of arthritis, deal with sports injuries. If it's something that can cause a functional problem for you in terms of your activities, a rehab doctor or a physical medicine and rehabilitation medicine physician is somebody who would be uh, relevant to possibly helping you get back on your path. So uh, one of the things that you've done in your lifetime is you are the physician, the, the, the uh, physician for the Philadelphia, no, for the, for the Philadelphia Ballet? Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Ballet. Pennsylvania ba Ballet. And you've been that for 25, 30 years? Approximately, but also for the Sioux Falls Roller Dolls. I so was the physician when I go, was in Sioux Falls. Go Roller Dolls. So, <laughs> so you have, a so there's a paradox. I mean, there is a, all sides of a spectrum. Uh, but you're also an editor. Tell Correct. us about that experience. Well, um, I recently was named to be the associate editor for dance for a journal called Medical Problems of Performing Artists. Because dancers are a unique, a unique population in terms of their uh, health, issues because uh, ballet dance in particular, but dance generally, uh, poses unique stresses on the, uh, on the body and therefore injuries that dancers may get can be uh, somewhat unusual even within the field of sports medicine. Now, oftentimes these are young, younger women and oftentimes and men. they're very, well, and men, and but, men. but uh, oftentimes these are people who are on strict diets to stay thin, and so they may be malnourished in some way that may set them up for bony injuries. Now, what do you think of that? Well, I think that that's, it's always, a, I think the relevant comment, and you are, you are correct, that what we eat is to some degree what we are, yeah. and that food is the fuel. And whether one is weight restricting or not, what we eat remains relevant to our health. And it is true that if you are uh, highly restricting calcium, vitamin D, um, there can be negative protein. effects on bone mass, right. protein that will persist uh, throughout one's life. 
And um, interestingly, when we look at other uh, fields within sports, such as uh, professional jockeys, who absolutely have to, you know, maintain a certain, Weight. you know, yeah. type of uh, body body, body uh, mass, yeah. um, it can have implications for health. So wrestlers? this is not just unique to dance. Yeah, no wrestlers too. I mean, you know, absolutely, you, you have about, to make your your class. Yeah, they make their class and they force themselves to weigh. I mean, I know people who weigh. 140 pounds for their wrestling, and then when you know they're done, they weigh normally 170. I mean, well, well, right. And I think it's it's so important to think about what am I doing, and what are the what are the effects of my nutrition on my health, and what are what are the effects not just now, but what am I setting myself up for? Cardiovascular risk. Um, you know, uh, bone health risk, and one could go on and on. Well, and on. mental capacity, mental health. Correct. Is, uh, all sorts of things that non nutrition. Correct. And you know, when when I was in medical school, and when you were in medical school, we were taught about uh, people who were elderly, who had a very restricted diet, who got into all kinds of nutritional yeah. difficulties, and then got into all kinds of physical difficulties. Yeah. To follow so, the nutrition. Exactly. Person. So whatever age and whatever stage the nutrition is important. Right. Uh, so uh, we're talking about pains and, and uh, complaints of, uh, of the typical person. Probably the most common I injury is a twisted ankle. I remember one time jumping on my sailboat, my little 20-foot sailboat on Lake Ponset, and I hit my foot just wrong and I twisted the ankle. I mean, it went Yow, ow. <laughs> and I said, now I just want to undo that. I, that just a second lasted only a second. Let's not do that. I was I was in trouble for you know three, four, five weeks, six weeks maybe. And so you can't undo the injury, the accident. But you can learn from it. Yes, you can. <laughs> can't you? And I haven't had that twisted ankle since. I learned. There you go. You don't jump around like that on that sailboat. The question I have is though, what do? What's your initial approach to? let's say a twisted ankle. Well, you know, I think if it's a twisted ankle and you're, you're able to, you know, be very upset at yourself, but walk away from it, albeit with pain, but if you can walk away from it and, you know, the pain is not so, so severe, our initial impulse is to rest it and, you know, uh, give ice, compression, elevation. Now, what, say that again, rest, rest ice, ice, compression, compression elevation and then actually to begin a, a rehabilitation program and people hear a rehabilitation program and that sounds terribly difficult and, and very professional but of course it's what we all do for ourselves after an injury but before we go into that rehabilitation let's talk about rice one more time so people can remember the word rice which stands for rest ice compression, elevation, and that sounds really mysterious too. Rest means, you know. Don't jump around on stop. it when it hurts. If you've, if you've jumped on your sailboat once and you've twisted your ankle, don't repeat it three additional <laughs> times. Yes. That's the first part of, of, of uh, rest. Ice is, you know, basically we're trying to put cold in because we really would like to help with swelling because the initial swelling can cause problems in terms of the injury resolving. Now, I mean, you can put a bag of ice on it. You can do a bag of frozen peas. I mean, what, Correct. What, and for how long? 15 minutes, four times a day? What do you say? You know, I say that you use ice. You kind of get that ankle in there, get the um, swelling down, get the ankle back out, because we never want to get, you know, skin burns from ice. Right. And people can, can, you know, and certain people have different circulation than other people. I mean, people who have diabetes and may have vascular compromise are or other people. Are a different issue. You gotta be right. careful with the ice. You have to be careful with the ice. And then you only do ice for a couple days and then you do heat so that it can heal, right? Exactly, because we want to get blood flow in there. And why do we want blood flow? Because we want oxygen. And oxygen helps that injury heal. And so, you know, the thinking process on managing this changes from the initial to um, further on, in a really severe sprain, one might even need to be in a boot at first, right, you know, right, one of the right. surgical boots. But we don't want that to be a long-term thing if possible because, of course, we don't want you to get weakness of other muscles that are involved, which will prolong 
and complicate your rehabilitation. Right. And I would just say, that reminds me of the days when we used to use back braces for people with back pain, uh, and their muscles would get weaker. We're going back. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, on a boot will uh, stabilize it, Correct. but the muscles will get weaker quickly. And, and so we you, still we need to rehab it. And yes. don't forget that just because one's in a boot doesn't mean that one can't do a form of exercise called isometric where we're not changing the joint position, but we're still doing muscular Exercise. activity. Right. So there's all kinds of Thanks. ways that you know physical medicine and rehab doctors and clinicians who are working with this think about your coming back from an injury because the longer we keep you off it, the of weaker course, your muscles get. The weaker you get, and not just that. You know, a lot of what we do in our life depends on constant feedback to that marvelous organ called the brain and our sense of balance will decrease. You kind of lose where you are in space a little bit. Your balance is a little bit off. Your different muscle patterns of recruitment, which again can prolong your recovery. That's why you need to have rehabilitation. So we did, uh, we did rest, we did ice. Compression is an ace wrap. Compression can be an ace wrap. People sell um, sleeves for certain things like ankle fractures. You know, um, when I go to the gym, I, I usually see a combination of uh, ankle sleeves and elbow sleeves yeah. <laughs> that people have on. Yeah. But there are work. different things, and, they're, and they're, those are helpful. And then the, and the elevation, how long do we elevate and how high do we elevate? You know, um, a useful way to think about it is you want to keep the limb up, preferably um, so that you can get drainage back. To the heart. Exactly. So above the level of your heart. Right. So, you know, but theoretically, you know, it's on a practical level, it can be very difficult for people to do that. You know, that yeah. leg is kind of up there. Yeah. But at least not so that you're just letting things hang down. Do not let it hang getting down. Getting big ballooned out, swelling, we, yeah. we would rather not. We, we like elevation. We want that, we want that, that elevated. All right. The condition our muscles are in can not only prevent injuries, but determines how well we recover when injuries do occur. So a podiatrist is a doctor that treats any ailment or uh, deformity of the foot and ankle. Um, so we focus on things like arthritic pain, bunions, hammer toes. Um, we even deal with fractures of the foot and ankle. Um, those kinds of things, uh, any sort of soft tissue, nerve problems. So any any problem that you have with the foot or ankle is tip, is what your podiatrist is going to deal with. The most common causes of foot pain that I see here in, in my clinic are things like uh, plantar fasciitis, arthritic pain. I occasionally will see things like neuromas. And uh, in your elderly patients, I think it's more like arthritis and some things that we call like metatarsalgia or just kind of pain in the balls of the feet. You know, to start out with like a, say like a neuroma, um, that's usually what we call it, it's an entrapment of a nerve that's between two bones in your foot. If we look at this foot model here, kind of, a lot of times it's between these, the third and fourth toes and it's an entrapment of the nerve back here but behind the ball of your foot. That can kind of feel like to the patient like they're, they have a lump in their shoe or they have some sort of shocking sensation, maybe even a numbness or burning sensation. And those, uh, typically we treat those initially with some sort of padding, some orthotics, maybe even uh, a steroid injection to try to get the nerve to calm down. If we're talking about things like arthritis, uh, in, in elderly patients I see that more with, in the ankle, we see it a lot in the big toe joint back here. Uh, those things we typically treat initially with some sort of anti-inflammatory, whether it's oral or even, again, another steroid injection to try to get the inflammation to calm down. What happens in arthritis is the cartilage wears down and it becomes, they have exposed bone. And when those bone surfaces rub on each other, that causes pain. When it comes to things like plantar fasciitis, um, that's, that's a pain in the heel. They typically feel it on the bottom of their heel more towards the inside. Really, it's, it's an overuse injury. It's not directly tied to a specific injury. And it's inflammation of a fibrous band that goes along the bottom of your foot, kind of helps form your arch. And again, treated a lot of times with a steroid injection initially to try to get some calm down. We'll have them do some exercises to try to stretch out that band. Um, Anti-inflammatories, again, orthotics or anything similar to that to try to um, pad the area, kind of help sometimes even alter their biomechanics or the way they walk so that we can relieve some of the pressure to the heel. In my mind, if you stay uh, in touch with a podiatrist or have regular visits with a podiatrist, those are things that can be pretty easily prevented in most instances.
Well, it's interesting, Judith. Uh, some people say that if you uh, make your feet feel better, it, it just sends ripples of happiness throughout the rest of the body. I mean, the foot is the center for a lot of good things. Uh, you're you're a, a ballet dancer, doctor. Uh, what's your response to what Dr. Haynes suggested? That was a nice, you know, kind of concise summary of things going on in the foot. Well, I think that's that's a really important point because let's just say for the sake of argument, you have a lot of foot pain and you're um, doing uh, substitution patterns to walk. It can affect other joints. So, you know, who hasn't met a met a met a person who's sprained an ankle? And then they say, you know, now my back is just killing, killing me. <laughs> First of all, walking on those those crutches, you know, yeah. requires you know Olympic training <laughs> for most <laughs> patients. So we can begin there. But separately from that, when you sprain your ankle and you're substituting patterns of how you walk, gosh, there's additional stress at the knee. So you sprain your ankle, and maybe you have a little knee arthritis. Maybe you have a little hip arthritis. Maybe you have a little chronic low back pain. Well, suddenly these chronic things can yeah, become can much more acute yeah. because we're putting additional biomechanical stress. It's a change. It's a change, yeah. exactly. So I, I am with this doctor when he says happy feet yes. are important. <laughs> Wasn't there a movie like that well, also? Happy feet. Yeah, happy there feet. Is. <laughs> Those were about penguins, though, weren't they? I mean, well, you know, but, so, but still uh, some of the concepts remain relevant. Yes, <laughs> happy feet is an important concept. So uh, uh, let's talk, if we're going to look at the people watching this show, many of them have had hip pain or knee pain mm -hmm. or low back pain. Right. Those are the biggies yes. that we see in a population as you're going through life, not the football player at 20 or at, at 17. Well, you'll see him back. Yeah, <laughs> I will. He, he will be back in he the He will office. be back. But um, so uh, what general thing about hip pain would you like to make sure that people understand? Well, you know, I think um, one general comment about hip pain is hip pain is tremendously disabling for a lot of our, our patients. And, you know, we tend to say hip pain, but, you know, we always would like to think of our patients holistically. And so, you know, hip pain is one part of a spectrum, usually, of what is bothering patients. And many of our people with chronic low back pain they also say, gosh, doctor, my hips are also hurting me. And we don't want to be thinking about things in isolation. So when we look at our patients, for example, with chronic low back pain, many of them have hamstring tightness, which is quite significant. And they also have a lot of tightness of the muscles and um, ligaments that go down along the outside of the leg. And if we just treat the um, back pain, we can miss something that's contributing to it which is possibly at that point a subclinical tightness where the patient's not even noticing it, but, but it's causing low back pain or low back pain that is causing um, the, the just the reverse or order. Yeah. So we need to think holistically and look beyond, oh, it's your hip that's hurting, and yeah. think about things in terms of, you know, how are different joints and different structures interacting. Right. And, you know, frankly, um, you and I both know that uh, maybe our patients are not um, completely clued in to whether or not they should be stretching until they have an issue. But then once they have an issue, they really don't know where to start. So I, I, I think you, you nail it, though, with the idea that stretching all your life is yes. a good idea, uh, particularly exercisers. If you're a runner, for example, you Correct. need to stretch those muscles so that you don't set yourself up for an injury. And I often, they say, what stretches do I do? And I'd say, stretch which, what is tight and stretch everything, you know, and balance it. Well, that's exactly right. And you know, it's very interesting. Many times people don't realize how asymmetric they are, including for their strength. And so, um, you know, it can be very helpful to be working symmetrically because it places less stress on one, one joint. Side or the other, yeah. You know, people um, commonly come in, they say, oh, I never knew how much my other hip was bothering me until this hip started bothering me. <laughs> and now I'm walking asymmetrically and I realize I have problems yeah. in both. Right. Uh, we've got some questions. We appreciate the questions. Keep them coming. 1 888 37, did I say 48? 
1-888-376-6225. We thank you for your questions. A man from Rapid City has muscles and knees that hurt mildly for most of the day, but the pain is much more intense when walking, especially up and down stairs. Why is that, and what can he do about it? That's a clue, isn't it, that it hurts worse walking? That is a clue, and it's, um, it's a clue also that it, it hurts uh, more going up and down stairs. And frankly, it may be a combination of things for this uh, person. Um, first of all, when somebody has um, uh, pain that is aggravated by walking, um, we worry that the blood flow is is adequate to the legs. To the legs. Yeah. I mean, that's you know the that's first thing, which is completely case. separate from a muscular or right. arthritic that's condition. That's a vascular thing. That's a vascular thing, and that's an important thing to make sure that that's to make not sure. Happening. Okay, exactly. But, but when it's not that. But let's say it's not that. Okay. <laughs> so um, one condition where people get much worse pain with mobility and walking is actually can be caused from problems with the nerves in the low back getting squeezed by usually arthritis in the back. Yeah. And spinal, uh, spinal stenosis. stenosis is the, the doctor's term. But you know, a good way to think about it is the space for the nerves just is just too too tight. So you're telling me that this person's going to need surgery? Not necessarily. No, not at all. And actually, the other um, issue is the stairs are kind of a clue too, because of course when we're walking on stairs as opposed to walking up and down stairs, as opposed to walking on level ground, well, our joints uh, really know that when we're walking up and down stairs because we're loading them in a different way. So there may be a combination of things even okay. with arthritis possible nerve problems, and as you and I discussed, even blood flow okay. can, play a, can play a role here. But let's simplify it, and let's just say it is a nerve squeezed by a disc and or smi spinal stenosis. Okay. What can this person do short of going to the surgeon who may recommend back surgery? I mean, what would you recommend? Well, you recommended it when you said stretching. stretching. <laughs> so actually, you kind of uh, led the way. Actually, there is uh, stretching. Um, there are exercises to help our balance so that we have less muscular challenge when we walk because, of course, when our balance is impaired, we recruit muscles in ways that can be quite uncoordinated, which places more stress than we need to okay. place. And there are medications that can help. So there are, there are a wide variety of treatments that can and does help. This, does this always last forever and get worse, or is this something that will go away in six weeks? You know, um, spinal stenosis can be progressive um, in terms of arthritis being progressive, but it does not have to necessarily be that somebody's symptoms are progressive, you know, but it's somebody who probably needs guidance from a clinician on how to first assess what is actually going on with a physical exam correlated most likely, I would think, with diagnostic testing in this case and um, with an appropriate uh, treatment program. But more too often, we're recommending surgery as a quick out when stretching and a stretching program and a rehabilitation program, physical therapy would Correct. be an appropriate thing. A woman from Watertown has peripheral neuropathy. She walks very flat-footed and trips often. What, what do you suggest for her peripheral neuropathy? Well, for our listeners, um, when we talk about peripheral neuropathy, uh, a simple way to think about it is our body, you know, our body is electric, and when electricity has to go a really long way, it tends to get into more trouble than when it has to go a short way. So when somebody has peripheral neuropathy and those nerves have to go all the way to our feet, that's usually where people will most Feel commonly mm -hmm. begin to have problems. What right. kind of problems do people have? They can have numbness, and they can have balance problems. And when people have balance problems or numbness, you don't really quite feel where the floor is, you can trip. And so um, what kind of suggestions do we have for people with this yeah. issue? I think the first question that is important to ask is why someone has a peripheral neuropathy. Right. Because if it would be something that could be treated and maybe the symptoms could get better because, for example, somebody has a vitamin deficiency. Vitamin B12 deficiency. Exactly. It's a vitamin deficiency that's causing this weakness. Well, you could maybe take a vitamin and 
improve. Right. So I think the first question is, why does one have a peripheral neuropathy? Right. In our country, I'd say many people have peripheral neuropathy on the basis of diabetes. I think that's probably a, a fair comment. And alcohol. improved diabetes control. Better diabetes control. Better diabetes, diabetes control. Alcohol is toxic to our nerves, and right. alcohol can cause neuropathy. Thiamine, I mean, uh, thyroid, thyroid. Thyroid issues. issues, exactly. So underlying metabolic or medical conditions need to, need be, to be addressed, yeah. need right. to be evaluated and addressed. Well, that's well the first once that's thing. done. But let's just assume that's been done. Yeah. So how do, how do we approach this? Somebody's tripping. I think there, there's two different issues. One is we look at the environment. Is there a challenging environment for that person to navigate? Throw rugs in the presence of balance disorders are a unfortunate path to trauma <laughs> yeah. because you trip and then in addition to the peripheral neuropathy, one has a hip fracture. Yeah. So this is not good. No. So we need to first, again, thinking holistically, if there is a challenge to balance, get rid of challenges to balance, right. good lighting, no throw rugs, lack of impediments, handrails, electric rails, cords, hand electric rails. cords so look environmentally. A cane. I like to suggest people to use a cane, and, it, and a cane doesn't have to be really strong. It just needs to tell you where you are in space. Correct. So An additional can, input. Right. Additional it, input. It could be a yardstick even, but I'm suggesting a cane, and you can have a double purpose. It can you can lean on it, but very, mostly it just tells you where you are. Very reasonable. And if someone has peripheral neuropathy with weakness, strengthening programs. Peripheral neuropathy frequently is associated with tightness. Stretch. What we, as you said it. There it is. <laughs> Stretching. So I think these are the these are some of some of the important concepts in the treatment of an admittedly challenging condition for many patients. Right. A woman from Viborg would like to know what's the difference between spraining a joint and straining a joint. Well, you know, when you when you sprain your ankle, you the um, ligaments to the ankle have been stretched and sometimes they're torn and that's a sprain and um, if you have had the opportunity to work on a farm you understand what straining your back muscles is. Yes. <laughs> so a strain is probably a less injured uh, ligament. It, it's just less so. A sprain, a sprain typically you're stretching a ligament and you know straining you, you can strain a muscle for example. Right. So uh, and ligaments are those fibrous tissues between bones. Tendons are muscle to bone. There's the Co difference. Correct. Uh, a 46-year-old woman from Brookings asks uh, that you talk about sciatica. Despite rest and therapy, I still hurt when running. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. Well, I like the fact that she's running. <laughs> and uh, but So she's having trouble running because she's having sciatica. Let's explain what sciatica is. Well, sciatica, there's an enormous bundle of nerves that runs down the back of our thigh that starts from the spine. And so um, when someone has sciatica, we typically are talking about uh, shocks or pain that's running down most commonly the back of the leg toward the foot. And when we run, of course, we're, we're challenging nerve because we're working typically at a pretty rapid pace. Right. And it, it really, again, we come to the question of why does this person have sciatica? Um, and what type of running is this person doing? And what kind of footwear is this person wearing? Because all of these factors can um, affect the risk of having nerve pain. Now, so you'd say get better shoes, low, decrease your distance. Correct. Uh, maybe a smaller distance uh, more frequently, but not the long distances. And, exactly. And, and also try to understand what the basis of the sciatica is. Right. Make, evaluate that. Make exactly. Sure. Because maybe this person, you know, although we think we've done a stretching program, and many people think they have done a stretching program, but actually when someone who is trained evaluates that person, the still, there is still asymmetric flexibility which usually, um, when one stretches and one has, an, has um, not done stretching that's graded based on injury, someone stretches symmetrically and actually um, ends up with a greater discrepancy. You can end up with a greater discrepancy in flexibility from side to side. 
which is kind of it's, it's, it's counterintuitive, yeah. but because you think you're doing the right thing, and you are, but you can be can, you can actually still resulting in a discrepancy in flexibility from side so, to side. So how do you fix that? I mean, how do you do that? You just say flex, uh, you stretch. You get advice okay. from somebody who's trained if you're in trouble with this so that you can do a more is. focused rehabilitative program. Okay. And you know, I think this is also one of those situations where um, it probably is good to know that no pain is, is you know, no gain here because I think you probably need to find out what's going on to make sure that running through pain isn't causing a problem. Yeah, there it is. The condition of our muscles are in cannot only prevent injuries, but determines how well we recover when injuries do occur. Let's see it this time. With athletic training, we see a, a lot of patients that are student athletes here at South Dakota State University. We see them for a, a, an array of uh, injuries or illnesses or issues, you know, that includes muscle strains, ligament sprains, sickness, any illness issues that they might have. Most of the injuries that we see are, you know, ankle sprains, knee sprains, hip, we have a lot of labrum tears, we have, you know, hip strains of that nature too. With any student athlete that we know is going to go to surgery, we'll have them do a lot of what's called prehab. And they'll do a lot of muscle strengthening, you know, uh, a lot of stretching, you know, any range of motion type deficits that they might have before they go to surgery. The more strength and range of motion that we have before the injury, when we do a typical surgery, we'll have a lot of immobilization period. So we'll be in, they'll be in a cast or a brace or a splint that they have to wear for a certain period of time to protect the healing tissue for a surgery. And the more range of motion and flexibility and strength that they have for that joint or issue that they have before they go to surgery, that will actually help them recover a lot faster. Basically, first day after surgery, we're restricted on what we can do based on the uh, physician's protocol or the surgeon's protocol. We work first off to start off and get as much range of motion as we can. We typically recommend to our student athletes that you come in when you're having an issue for athletic training. For as far as physical therapists or any other healthcare provider, you know, we recommend that if you're having an issue to go in and, and see a, a recognized healthcare provider to take care of your injuries. I think the best way to prevent an injury from happening is to make sure that the student athlete or you know general patient is, is strong enough and ready, you know, from a physical well-being standpoint to start that activity. Um, you know, you wouldn't jump in and run a marathon right away without training and having a good base built up and strength and range of motion and um, having that ability to work up to the point where the activity that they're doing is, is important that we, we structure it and build up a little bit and don't just jump two feet into the pool. So while we're listening to this gentleman talk about the value of prehab, which I think is just huge, and, and the variety of different issues, um, you were talking about what is more relevant, what is more important than rehab. Uh, so many people go to surgery and may not need it. Uh, t tell me more about that particular comment. Well, I think, you know, you know as physicians, we, we, we end up unfortunately talking about illness a lot, but really we are intimately um, concerned with health. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, basically we want, we want all of our patients to function as well as possible. And so the concept of prehab that was just mentioned, I think about how do we optimize our ability to heal from, you know, the basically the assaults of daily living <laughs> as yes. you go about your day, yeah. which include, frankly, resilience from stress, proper new nutrition, um, maintaining good cardiovascular conditioning, um, and you know, uh, s adequate strengthening programs and adequate stretching programs. We talk about muscle pain, and you know, who, who among us, who in our audience, has not had a day filled with stress and then ended up with a neck ache. Yeah. And so, you know, it's- There's a, The brain works too on the, this whole the brain, <laughs> the, the brain is solving it for yeah. us. And so I think that it's important to think about prehab because it helps, it both helps us be more in tune with our bodies and helps us toward overall health, 
which if we unfortunately happen to have an injury, helps us understand how to get back to our optimal functionality, whatever that may be. I've often recommended, uh, because people that I see are commonly not in fabulous condition. They're, they're at, lo low, at level zero oftentimes. And so how can I uh, encourage them to get better or to get into an exercise program? So I'm always talking about walking. Walking. Good for you. you know, and you talk to people who are 70 or older. Uh, they can almost all of them walk. And even the people who have the worst bone on bone, knees and hips and so on and so forth, they do better if they're walking than they are sitting on that couch. Well, exactly. And basically, it's important to think about if somebody is having difficulty with one exercise program, how can, how can an exercise be adapted? And it's interesting that we talk about activity, but of course, activity is part of a continuum. And, you know, Americans don't sleep. <laughs> they yeah, they, they we, could we do know, better with that. We know that it's, so it, it's, it's as, as you and I constantly talk about, it is a balance, and it has to be a healthful balance of activity, recovery time, activity, recovery time. Yeah. Because systems will fail if they are just consistently challenged without time to recuperate, no matter how fantastic right. one's um, physical shape is. So let's say that this person is absolutely going to go to surgery. No question, they come back to your office, okay, doc, he, my knee is... Well, you obviously were not their doctor. <laughs> <laughs> no. They got in that trouble because I, I wasn't there, right? No. You were so, not the clinician. <laughs> yes, there it is. Well, the idea of getting those muscles strong as that we possibly can before they go to surgery makes sense because then they'll have ligaments and you'll have tendons and you'll have... Blood flow. Blood flow and you'll have strength. And that can, balance. And balance so that you can do it. So it's important that you're in shape before you get that surgery. Correct. And of course, part of that is healthful lifestyle. And those of you out there who are smoking, stop. Yeah, that's a tough, that's a, that's a very hard thing on your body. It's a tremendously hard thing on and, your body and it's difficult to quit, but nonetheless, how can one say it enough? Yeah. Okay, a man from Huron would like to know, and you know, we've got a bunch of questions, so a little bit quicker answers. We're going to have to get, sure. to get through this. A man from Huron would like to know what are the most common areas to, to get severe tendonitis. Now explain tendonitis and then... Well, you know, tendonitis is an acute inflammation in a tendon. And, you know, actually that's a really great question because often tendonitis comes from overuse. And so it really depends what you're doing. Tennis elbow right. is if a tendonitis? If you're, a, if you're playing tennis, you're getting uh, tendonitis on the outside of your elbow. And if you're playing golf, you're getting tendonitis on the inside of your oh, elbow. That's interesting. I didn't and so that. it depends how you're using your body. And what do you recommend? I know that people talk about those braces and so on yes. for, for tennis elbow. Yes. Do they do that for, for the golfer's elbow too? We, we do that for golfer's elbow too because basically what those braces do there's a wide variety of ways to treat it, but among the ways is to use a brace because it, it tends to take pressure off where the um, um, insertion is on the bone. And so it tends to move the, the, uh, force, the force a little bit away from where things are inserting on bone. And that's where the pain is? Correct. All right. And what other tendonitis are there quickly? Well, there's all kinds, and you know, if people are treating runners, then they've seen uh, commonly Achilles tendonitis. Right, that says the Achilles tendon in the back big, of the leg. Big tendon in the back of the leg. To and the foot, where it attached to the foot and pushes you off as you're running. Exactly. Gee, and I got my hand right in your face there, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. Um, um, and basically, um, so people can have Achilles tendonitis, and there's all kinds of ways to treat, treat these. Um, tendonitis, in the acute phase, there's inflammation. Unfortunately, for some of our patients with chronic uh, tendon problems, the tendon can become thickened and kind of boggy, and we need to do a, a kind of actually completely different uh, method of treatment, which again focuses on stretching and exercise. And interestingly, we want to load the tendon okay. with a specific kind of program to help with the rehab. All right. We've got tons of questions and not Let's a keep, lot of time. We'll keep going. A woman from Lake Wilson, Minnesota would like to know, is it okay to be on a low-grade prednisone 
or even a non-steroidal, but she's asking prednisone to help tolerate back pain. You know, prednisone um, is a, a steroid, and steroids um, can cause problems for people depending upon their um, underlying medical Diagnosis, condition. Yeah. For example, our patients with diabetes, uh, prednisone can cause blood glucose Worsening elevation. Blood sugars, yes. So prednisone, short term, is a very different proposition from prednisone long term. But now people have polymyalgia rheumatica. Sometimes that's a five or a 10 milligram dose. Correct. And that's not so bad. Correct. It depends what, what it's being used for and for how long it's being used and frankly, what your underlying risk factors are, including things you wouldn't even think of, like your risk of having an ulcer. Right. Because steroids can or cause- personality changes. Right, can cause all kinds of different that's issues. So that's probably a question to be reviewed with your clinician. Talk to your doctor, that's a great question. Man from Aberdeen had knee replacement surgery four years ago, and nearly every night since then, he's had numbing pain in his knee when resting. Multiple doctors don't know what the cause is, do you have any insight into this difficult problem real quick? Well, you know, there are um, superficial nerves that are near the knee that um, can get um, injured uh, with a, a surgery or, frankly, from other things like a tight brace. Um, a tight brace is a big deal. Can, can cause can yeah. cause issues. Um, one can also have referred pain to the knee that's coming from... The hip. The hip, the back. So that's probably something that, that would need to be looked at. When people have numbness that goes down a leg, one can get testing that includes electrodiagnostic testing, where one studies the nerves and the muscles with a technique called electromyography. I've had patients come in. But it in starts with a good physical exam of, and of, history. Yeah, I've had people come in with knee pain, knee surgery, but it was their hip all along. Exactly, their and people can have um, Hip pain, and it was their their knee. their knee all along. So it needs to be looked at from a more you know general perspective. Right, a woman from Millbank has a hip that has been X-rayed and shows bone on bone, and wonders if there's an alternative to surgery. Bone on bone, hip, terrible pain. Well, you know, um, uh, with uh, bone on bone arthritis, uh, people typically have uh, this. Usually, doesn't happen overnight, and so people usually have settled into abnormal not abnormal, but perhaps less than helpful movement patterns. And people often have weakness of hip muscles that unfortunately uh, is, uh, can cause even more stress on the joint. Weight control is important um, for, for um, anybody with abnormal forces on the mechanics of the hip. But when do you take them to surgery? You know, I think if they have not done well with a, a really thorough, focused, rehab program and it is causing additional biomechanical stresses in other joints because we want people to have really really good quality of life yeah. and so and hip replacement for some of our patients is a wonderful, wonderful answer, answer. Yeah. but it is not the answer for everyone and some people for a variety of medical conditions can't even have the surgery and well, so there we need to think of other options and treatment and we really need to try the non surgical treatments first. I mean, bone on bone needs to go to surgery, but we go we go to surgery too quick, I think. Well, we th I think we need to think in a broad-based way about what options and treatment there are, including improved medication management yeah. for patients, because sometimes that can be helpful. But and frankly, topical ointments, where somebody is rubbing on an ointment, can give significant relief. What, what over-the-counter ointment that can be helpful that's not though, that expensive? There can be anesthetic ointments that can be helpful. There are anti-inflammatory ointments that are helpful. So there are Some of them are prescribed, and you can get them in compound pharmacies, Correct. and not that expensive. Correct. Talk to your doctor about there's Talk a compound pharmacy in Sioux Falls that's really great, and you can get excellent buys there. Um, I have a question. I have arthritis in my big toe, not a bunion, and recall surgery is a beneficial option to minimize the pain associated with that, but I was wondering if there are other options besides surgery for a bunion toe uh, that I can first see if it would, uh, would minimize the arthritis. Well, yes. Again, you know, there are options in terms of padding, that can be helpful. Orthotics can be helpful. So re um, changing shoe wear can be very helpful. Um, topical creams can be helpful. And um, sometimes people have abnormal forces because of how they're rolling on the foot. 
right. that if we can do exercises can remove some of the stress on the joint. W one quick uh, question, Ta what topical cream? Arthritis, uh, some kinds of ibuprofen topical cream? Gosh, there's, there's uh, such a range of things. We have everything available now from uh, Asper cream type ointments. What, what is your favorite? You know, it really depends on what I'm treating. I don't really have a favorite. Oh. Um, it depends if I'm treating something where I think it's more of an arthritic condition versus more of a neurologic condition. Yeah, if it's arthritic, what do you use? If it's arthritic, I tend to go with something that's an anti-inflammatory base. Like? Um, for example, like an Asper cream yes. or you know a, a prescription ointment if I need something stronger. Yeah, naproxen ointment, that type of a thing? Voltaren type of ointment. Voltaren ointment. Or if it's something um, that is neurologically based, then a compounded ointment can be very helpful. Like? Um, for example, gabapentin ointments. Gabapentin ointment. If I think it's muscle tightness that is causing the problem, we have baclofen that's available okay. as an ointment. Wow. If we think it's a generalized pain, there are additional options in treatment. We have many. We have more of a range than people are aware of for what can be done with that. Good. A woman from Aberdeen was diagnosed Martin's neuroma. Mm -hmm. uh, and is having uh, pain, uh, Morton, it's actually Morton's neuroma, right. and having, I, and I have it as well, discomfort, receiving a cortisone shot between their toes, is there something different that would help? Well, you know, Morton's neuromas, um, basically, um, you basically have ner nerve pain in between your feet from a swelling that's um, along a nerve. From running or stuff like that. Or, you know, just, you know, daily Order. use, you're, you're walking. I'm, not all Morton's neuromas are symptomatic, but you know, when they are, they're, they're troublesome. And you can have nerve numbness as well as nerve pain. Correct. And so, um, exactly. And so I think that um, if someone is having pain from a Morton's neuroma, one thing that can be helpful is building up the muscles of the foot so that there is um, less direct trauma to the nerve because sometimes when people are walking without a lot of soft tissue padding, there can be more direct trauma to nerves. So pad it. Pad it okay. and exercise to help uh, improve the architectural structure of the foot. Okay. Can you talk about how to treat an inflamed bursa on the hip outside of the swimming and resting? Nearly everything I do gives me pain. A bursa that's swollen and inflamed how about injecting that with, uh, with a little cortisone and, and lidocaine? Well, interestingly enough, many times when people have hip bursitis, actually it's a problem in um, a muscular complex that's on the outside of the hip. And people have uh, many times degeneration or, or actually even tears within uh, the... So it's not as simple as I'm making it. It's not as simple as you're making it <laughs> because um, uh, muscles um, that attach there... Um, can uh, um, can be problematic, and also there can be degeneration in structures there. Injection can be uh, one treatment. Stretching can be a treatment. Frankly, strengthening other muscles so that there's less stress on that area can be a treatment. But this is something that needs to be evaluated Addressed by somebody. Who yeah, knows this what needs doing. to be evaluated so that we can recommend best options in, in care. But frequently, it's not an, although people absolutely can have an inflamed bursitis. Frequently, it's actually something that's more chronic that is causing the problem, which is interesting to think about. Yeah. And now for the winner of tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question. True or false, the best treatment for tendonitis is non-medicinal combination of physical treatments and a plan of gradual increase in activity, and the answer is true, of course. <laughs> I knew the answer. <laughs> yes, I did too. It was Marilyn Iverson from Murdo who answered the question correctly. Thank you, Marilyn, for a part participating, watching, and a book will be in the mail to you soon. Any, any further thoughts about uh, this? Nope, we got to go. We'll be right back <laughs> after this. All around town, from stores to playgrounds, babies are on the move. And there are diseases that are on the move, too. And some of these spread easily. To best protect him from 14 serious diseases by the time he turns two years old, vaccinate him according to the recommended schedule so he can go on about his business and you can have peace of mind. For more reasons to vaccinate, talk to your child's doctor or go to cdc.gov forward slash vaccines. March basketball tournaments this year were bouncing along the TV screen when a player fell. The replay showed how one fellow was shoved off balance and came down trying to stop his fall.
The camera was watching as his ankle gave way and the foot turned inward. When he stood again, he was limping, and I could almost feel his pain made more obvious by the disappointment on his face. It was unavoidable. He was out of the game and tournament with an injured ankle. I don't know for sure, but I imagine the trainer examining his foot and noting no deformity, making it less likely to be a broken bone. As the examiner feels the outside areas of the ankle, I can almost hear the player admonishing the trainer, stop that, that's where it hurts. As the player's foot turned in, most likely one or more of the three outside ligaments were stretched and possibly torn. Ligaments are the very tough fibrous tissue that connect bone to bone, which are different than tendons connecting muscle to bone. In this player's case, it's likely the ligaments involved were those that tie the outer bone of the lower leg to the ankle bones of the foot and that are meant to keep the ankle from turning too far inward. Ligaments between bones are strong bonds and allow for minimal movement while preserving stability. Test your own ankle movement by repositioning the ankle side to side or inward and outward. Note how limited that motion is when compared to the up and down movement of the foot as the calf muscles and Achilles tendon push you off, helping you walk or run. Without the side to side stability ligaments, the foot would not be capable of normal walking on irregular ground, let alone running, turning, or leaping required to play in a basketball game. What's almost more incredible is how pain from such an injury forces us to rest and protect the ankle so it can heal. The treatment for this injury, and for almost any ligament or tendon injury, is directed by the mnemonic RICE. R is for rest, I for ice, C for compression wrap, and E for elevation. Most certainly, the trainer will use those directives, and over the next two weeks, the player will gradually move back to careful and easy walking once again. In about six weeks, 90% of healing will be achieved. Next season, he'll be ready to play again. So go to our website for the questions that we didn't get to. We just didn't get, we had lots of good questions. Go to prairiedoc.org and check on uh, the questions that we couldn't get to. A big thank you to our guest uh, and friend, Dr. Judith Peterson. As always, it's been a treat to have you help us with this tonight's program, this very interesting topic. Between 40 and 50% of Americans who live to the age of 65 will have either basal cell carcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma at least once. With summer approaching and our time outside increasing, remember to use proper sunscreen. The American Academy of Dermatology recommends everyone use sunscreen that offers broad spectrum protection that protects against UVA and UVB rays with a sun protection factor or an SPF of 30 or higher. Well, that does it for tonight from all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Overindulgence, stress, or the common cold, there are many causes and a variety of cures. Headaches, causes, effects, and treatments. Next time, On Call with the Prairie Doc. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting.
Larson Manufacturing is proud to support on-call television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. Brookings Health System. Ophthalmology Limited. South Dakota State Medical Association. Avira Heart Hospital. Dakota Allergy and Asthma. Fishback Financial Corporation. Vance Thompson Vision. Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy. Aberdeen District Medical Society. Black Hills Medical Society. Dakota Bank. Orthopedic Institute. Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee and Swiftel Communications.